ladies don't mind coming up here. Plenty of room up here. There's a few seats. There's three seats down the front here. There's a seat in the second row. Looks like there's a couple seats over here down front. If some of you young ladies don't mind, there's still some room up here on the stage. You can come have a seat. There's some room down front. You can even put your Bible down here on the stage and write and take notes. <laughs> Looks like we have some room down here if you happen to some of you young ladies, if you want to come down this way, there's some room on the stage. Let's get as many people in here as we can. There's three seats in the front row. Available. If you see a seat in the middle of your row that's not taken, would you all mind moving in toward that seat and taking up the seats in the middle so that the outside seats are available for people entering? Right here. Second seat in. Seat over next to Miss Carrie. That's mine. There's a seat next to Miss Carrie, and Miss Carrie's going to vacate her seat, so that's going to be available soon. If everybody could take a seat as quickly as possible, we can get started. We're cutting into Miss Carrie's time. We are glad you're all here for the 2024 Ladies Lectures. Ladies, is anyone missing their fan? Is this belong to anyone here? Ladies, if we could hurry up and take a seat so that we can begin. You've probably all been here many times, but those of you who have not, there are ladies' rooms out to the left. Please exit the back door to use them if uh, it's in the middle of our speaker. We are glad you are all here. Our first speaker for the ladies' lectures this year is one of the most encouraging women I know. And she grew up in a watermelon melon farming family right here in Florida. And uh, those of you who are from other places, it's hard to find a native Floridian. <laughs> and yet we have one who is going to be speaking to us today. Uh, Carrie Black uh, embodies all the good qualities that farmers bring to us. She has an appreciation for God's creation. She has a strong work ethic, and she is has a down-to-earth nature that endears her to everyone who meets her. Carrie's been married for 27 years to Darren, who's a sergeant in the Polk County Sheriff's Office. And Carrie and Darren are the proud parents of three sons, Jacob, who graduated from Florida College in 2021 with his degree in Biblical Studies, and then Jeb, who graduated just last year in the first uh, graduating class of our mass media program in the communication degree. And her 
youngest son, Austin, is a senior in our kinesiology program, which will be graduating its first class this year. And in 2020, the family added the former Miss Annie Edwards to the family when she became Mrs. Jacob Black. And so Darren and Carrie have done a great job with uh, those three young men. I know all of them, and Annie as well. They are the salt of the earth, and they are a tribute to their parents' ability to uh, raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And Darren and Carrie have worked for all of their married life for 27 years with the Southwest Church of Christ Congregation in Lakeland, Florida. And Carrie currently is the manager of our bookstore here at Florida College. And she loves spending time with her family and enjoys playing and watching sports. She's actually a member of our Pelicans team. If you're not familiar, it's the faculty and staff team that plays against the society teams of the students. And I have seen Carrie play volleyball and um, softball and flag football. And she is an athlete and a fierce competitor, I might add. But more importantly for us is that she is a woman of the scriptures and she is a woman of fervent prayer. And when she walks away from those activities, she serves this college in ways that we are so blessed to have. And the students adore her, and so do her co-workers. And we're going to begin with a short prayer. And then we will hear Carrie uh, bring us a lesson on present yourself a living, a living and holy sacrifice. So let's go together in prayer. Good Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to gather this week. And thank you for this opportunity for us as women to be able to interact with one another. Thank you so much for Carrie, and please be with her as she brings her message to us today. And please be with us as we listen and take in the word that you have given us. We love you. Please forgive us of our sins. And please help us to use what we gather here this week to be better daughters of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, am I on? Perfect. I'm going to take just a minute to get myself settled. I'm not sure whose these were. I hope I don't need them. <laughs> but as Miss Joyce Jamerson has always told me, it's not a good talk if you don't have a good cry. <laughs> so we might need them before it's done. Let me get to my right pages here, and we will get ready to get started. It is um, such a pleasure to be with you all today. The first thing I just want to say is good morning. good morning. And if you know me, you know that's probably not going to be acceptable. So we'll say it again. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I am a high feedback speaker. So I am one of those, I'm an active listener. So when I'm listening to someone, I'm a good head nodder. And I appreciate that from my audience. So anybody who's willing to give that to me today, I will greatly appreciate you. Uh, my, my favorite question that my family tells me that I constantly ask is, you know, are you with me? Do you get that? So if you, if you give that to me, then I'll keep going and I won't belabor a point, which some of my children tell me I do quite often. So, um, I first want to begin by just saying a huge thank you to both Miss Kathleen Trigg and Miss Paula Walker. Um, sometimes these things happen and we don't really know how they've come together and happened, but these two ladies are the ladies that put together and coordinate the speakers for an event like this and come up with the theme of what we're going to speak to you all about. And I'm just thankful for the time and energy and effort that these two ladies have put into having a time for us to come together and to dive into God's word together. And so I just want to say a huge thank you to both Paula and Kathleen. They are uh, co-workers and friends, and I'm thankful to call them both. Um, Miss Kathleen alluded in my introduction to the fact that I am a very down-to-earth uh, farm girl, <laughs> and that is accurate. <laughs> um, I'm going to share with you a little bit before we get started that 
Um, because of that down-to-earth uh, southern nature, I tend to make up words. Um, <laughs> My family tells me this all the time. Um, I'm constantly referring to head honchos and thingamajigs and thingamabobs, and they, they've learned to understand my language. Um, very recently, I feel like I have been using a term a lot that um, I made up. So I'm just going to share with you that term because I feel like it's probably going to come out today and um, because I tend to use it when I'm excited or um, I'm concerned and some of those uh, things are going to come out in my talk today. But do you know how as a, as a mom, or even if you weren't a mom as a child, um, did your parent ever call you by the first and middle name? So like in our family it was Jacob Keith or Austin J or Jeremiah Ethan, which he's really Jeb, that got shortened. So his was just Jeremiah. It just got shortened altogether. If I needed their attention, that's what I said to them. Or if I was excited about something that I wanted to talk to them about. Um, and what I've heard myself using a lot lately, and I have no idea where it come, came from. Some of these things just come out. Um, but I, a lot of times I'll say, sister friend. And I've said that a lot lately. And it, what a blessing it is to look out into a room full of sister friends today. And so if you see me or hear me say sister friend, I want you to know that as a term of endearment, no one's in trouble. It's just <laughs> one of those things that it just comes out. I can remember my, my student worker, Lily, who's sitting over here to my right. Uh, she came into the bookstore this last week and she was pale and she didn't look good. And I sat down on the couch by her and I said, Sister friend, you need to go back to bed. <laughs> and, and she did, and that was good. <laughs> so I just want to give you that terminology before I begin so that you know that um, it is a term of endearment. And what a blessing it is for me to have the privilege to stand before you today. I also want to say before we get started that I am no Bible scholar. I am not an expert in things biblical like some of the talks that you are hearing um, throughout this week from men who are so well studied, but I am not a Bible scholar. I am not an expert. There will be no new and exciting truths given today. Um, I have listened to, I have a, almost a, a one hour commute uh, to here to work every day, and so I have listened to um, probably no less than 100 sermons on prevent, presenting yourselves a living sacrifice. So I have also had the blessing of hearing many of our, our fellow preachers preach on this subject, but my goal today is just to share with you uh, what I've studied, and I pray that you have some positive takeaways and some things that will help you think uh, more clearly about becoming a living sacrifice. And so with all that being said, sister friends, Let's dive into the word. So if you open up your Bibles, if you have them with you today, we're going to begin right at the passage that Paula and Kathleen have chosen for us, which is Romans 12 and verse 1. I'll get a little sip of water here. So if you will go to Romans 12, we're going to read the passage. All right, so we're going to read verses 1 and 2 together. And it says, I'm going to be reading, I'm so confused here, because I'm going to read to you from the New King James, which is on my paper, which I wrote last night because I tore everything up. I was not happy with what I had last night, so I just redid the whole thing. So I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version, and we're going to give you the new version that I came up with last night. So New King James here, but when I read to you from my Bible, it's New American Standard, so... And it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so before we dive 
into those verses, and we're really going to only focus on the first verse today. Uh, Miss Jory and Miss Christina are going to take you through verse 2 uh, tomorrow and Thursday, and so I pray that you'll come back to hear them. We're going to stay pretty focused in verse 1, but before we even begin to talk about what where Paul brings us to in chapter 12, I think it's really important for us to take a step back and look at the context of where we're even at, okay? And so Paul is the author of Romans, and he is speaking to the Christians in Rome. I told you I'm not a Bible scholar, but I can't figure that much out, right? So Paul is speaking to the Christians in Rome here, and for the first 11 chapters, everything that's going to bring us to chapter 12, Paul is really laying down some very foundational principles, Um, I'm not saying that there's not application in the first 11 chapters of Romans because there are, but most of it are foundational principles. So we're going to back up. We're just going to look at just a brief outline of what Paul is talking to these Roman Christians about. And so in chapters 1 through 3, Paul is telling them that they're sinners. We are sinners. All have sinned. So if you look at Romans 3 and verse 23, It's a very common verse that most of us are very familiar with, but it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because we are sinners, that's our first S word for today, because we are sinners, then we need salvation. And that's really what the next section is about. In chapters 3 and 4, he's going to talk to us about our salvation. And he's going to tell us that we we can't achieve salvation of our own merit. It doesn't, we don't earn our salvation. It's a gift that's freely been given by God. So if you look at Romans chapter 4 and verses 24 and 25, he's been talking about justification by faith, and he's been talking about how Abraham, how things have been credited to him through his righteousness. And he says, actually, we'll back up to verse 23. It says, Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, But for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So the first word is we're sinners. And because we're sinners, the second S word is we need salvation. And from that salvation and that justification, the result is in chapters 5 through 8 that we're sanctified. That that sanctification that we've been set apart. Paul is telling them you've been set apart. You should not practice sin any longer. We are to present ourselves over to a new mass and we are to use our bodies to practice righteousness. And if you look at we, with me in Romans chapter 8, and we'll just look at the first four verses there, Paul says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so we've been sinners. We've received salvation, not through our own merit. We've been sanctified. We've been set apart. And that all leads us to chapters 9 through 11, which talk about the sovereignty of God. That God can give salvation to anyone and everyone who loves him. And everyone who is willing to be obedient to him and to keep his commandments. Whether Jew or Gentile, whether slave or free, whether male or female... God is sovereign. He has all authority to give that to us. And that brings us to chapter 12. Okay? And basically the last four chapters of Roman, in chapters 12 through 16, that's going to be our final S word. We're going to talk about service to God. And that's what Paul is talking to these Roman Christians about. And again, we're going to go back one more step before we actually dive into the verse. 
I want to talk about one more word in going backwards, and that's just the word sacrifice. Okay, and so I want us to think for a minute back to the Old Testament and the way sacrifices were done in the Old Testament. And we can read a lot about it in Leviticus, and we're not going to land there. Uh, we're not going to spend a crazy amount of time. Um, I grew up on a farm. We slaughtered hogs. It's all like I could get into all the gory details, but I know there are some of you who don't appreciate that. So <laughs> we're not going to do that. Um, but there was a lot involved in the Old Testament sacrifices. They were animal sacrifices, um, and the purpose of those sacrifices was that, was that they were supposed to atone for the sin of the person that was offering the, the sacrifice. And so we know in a nutshell that what happened was that people would take their acceptable animal offerings, and there were a lot of um, rules, a lot of very specific natures of what those sacrifices were supposed to be. And they were to take those sacrifices to the priest. Um, they would then confess their sins. The animal would be killed and the entire animal, every part of it, would be burned and would be offered by the priest on that, on that person's behalf. And so this innocent animal took on the sins of the individual who was sacrificing it. And so the animal was suffering what the person should have received. And the animal that was taking the place of the person. And this points us to what Christ is going to be for us. And that's probably a pretty logical pathway there for most of us. But this is pointing us to what Christ is eventually going to do for us, for the sins of those who have chosen to believe. Okay? And so now that we've spent some time going backwards, just to get some context of where we're at, now I really want to take some time and let's dive in to our verse that we're looking at today. So let's go back again and let's read just verse 1 together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So let's just start at the beginning. And he uses a term in the New King James Version that we don't hear a lot of this word a lot. We don't hear a lot about beseeching. Is that a term you use normally in your everyday walk? It's not for this down-to-earth sister friend girl. So I had to do a little bit of research on what does this beseeching mean? But Paul is, he's urging them. He's begging them. He's desperately pleading with these Christians that he's talking to. Okay, remember he's gone back and he has outlined, he's just outlined everything that God has done for them. And all I can picture when I think about this beseeching and this Paul just begging and desperately pleading is, I think about, and you, maybe you've been on the end of this as a child, maybe you've been on the end of this as a parent, maybe you've just been on the end of this as a mentor. But I think of uh, somebody who has some wisdom about a situation and they can see what's best. So I think about, for instance, um, a parent of a child who's in a relationship and they see red flags everywhere. And they're just desperate because they can see it. They can see what's on the other side. They can see what's coming. Um, and they have this knowledge and they have this foundation and they want to go to that child and they want to sit that child down and they just want to desperately plead with them, look, I am telling you all of these things for a purpose. There's a reason why I'm telling you these things. And it's this love. I think Paul, he loves these people. Um, I don't even know that Paul had met the Christians in Rome actually at this point, but he knows enough that he loves these people and he wants them desperately to listen to what he is saying so he is beseeching them he is impl imploring them in the strongest of terms to live their lives with a steadfast determination to please God and I think that we can relate to that and maybe some of us have just been on the receiving end of that and if you've been somebody who's been on the receiving end of that um, I hope that you have opened your mind to that 
Um, and that's what Paul wants these Christians to do. He wants them to be open to what he's about to say. And so he is beseeching them and urging them. He is doing this by the mercies of God. Let's just camp out there for just a minute because he has just told them that we are all saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. And because of the life-giving, sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, this is why he wants us to present ourselves a living sacrifice because of these mercies of God. We're all, he's just told us we're all what? We're all sinners. We've all been condemned by sin. Uh, we all fall short, but God has offered all of us, everyone, a plan of salvation and justification Amen. if we will be faithfully obedient to Christ. And everybody, all the nations, the Jews and the Gentiles, all have access to this salvation. And so he goes on and he says, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, and that therefore uh, you're supposed to ask yourself, what's that there for? Okay? And so it's there because he's going back to those first 11 chapters at those foundational principles, and now he's moving us from those foundational principles into the application of, okay, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And so let's talk about this word present. Okay, so when I think of the word present, um, I think of the word um, offer, that we're offering something. It's funny that the word present can also be pronounced present. And when we think about a present, there's many ways we can think about that word, but it can also be thought of as a gift, right? And so when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, we are offering that. We're not being forced. We're not being coerced. Nobody's making us do this. This is a choice. So in the Old Testament, when we looked back and we talked about the sacrifices, it was the priests who brought, they brought the offering to the priests, and the priests would offer the sacrifice on behalf of the person. That's no longer the case. In the New Testament, under the new law and the gospel, you and I, we are both the offerer and the offering. We are uh, a priest, if, if you can imagine that. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9. And Peter tells them, You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And so we become the priests, and we become both the offerer and the offering. And I want you to think about that, because when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, it, it's quite the oxymoron when you think about it, right? It's kind of like jumbo shrimp, right? <laughs> living sacrifice, it's not, it doesn't really make sense. Like when we say it out loud, we say it out loud, and it's like, what does that mean? Because what we've always known is sacrifices are something that are dead, that we, that we kill. Um, but in this case, th what, I can't even wrap my brain around it. I'm going to be really honest with you. Um, Christ died so that we might live, but while living, we have to die to ourselves every day. And that, that's just, I know that sounds simplified, but it's mind-blowing to me, sister friends, <laughs> okay? It is mind-blowing to me. And that while living, and when we're having to die to ourself on this daily basis, I think that takes us right back to Romans 7, where he talks about this daily battle between our flesh and our spirit. And guess what, ladies? We all have that battle. Every single person in, that room, in this room, I don't care from the youngest to the oldest, most seasoned, knowledgeable, scholarly Christian lady in this room, we all battle our flesh and our spirit every day, okay? And so let's remember that as we treat one another and talk with one another. But we are living sacrifices. Um, and 
that word living, when I, th I want you to think about that. That's, a, that's an ongoing thing. It's not a one time we present ourselves as the sacrifice and we're done. We put ourselves on the altar and it's over. You know what happens is we put ourselves on the altar and then we crawl off. And, and then we got to put ourselves back on the altar, right? We take ourselves away from it. And, and that's that ongoing battle every day. Um, I was talking with our middle son, Jeb. Um, he's actually teaching our high school class right now, and they're studying Romans. And so I was having a conversation with Jeb about this talk, and this is the way Jeb coined it, and it, and it resonated with me. He said, you know, Mom, when, when I think about a living sacrifice, I think it's continuous dedication to do better every day. And I was like, wow, that just really simplified it for me, um, that it's a continuous dedication to do better every day. And I'm going to uh, spend some more time on that in just a moment. But I want you to stop for a minute, and let's just take a pause, and let's think about this word sacrifice, maybe outside of the spiritual Context. If you just think of the word sacrifice, like from the uh, Webster's Dictionary, um, it's not going to say anything about animals and death necessarily, um, but it's going to say it's a giving up of something for the sake of something else. Okay? How many of you can relate to giving up sacrifices? How many of you in this room feel like you have sacrificed something in your life? I hope you all do, because we should be trying to do this every day, right? Okay? And we go through this. How many of you, let me ask a different question. How many of you feel like you know a person who you feel like epitomizes sacrificing? Yes, I do. I have a friend, a dear friend. Um, uh, her name is Gailey. And I'll just leave it at that. Some of you know her. Um, but she is just one of those people that every time I see her, she's just serving people uh, humbly, sincerely. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. It's been that way her whole life. You know how I think some of us, we go through seasons and it's cyclical. She's just one of those people that every time I see her, she would give you the shirt off her back. She would literally do anything for anyone. Uh, she is no respecter of persons. And so when I think about, like, somebody who uh, can sacrifice and does it so easily, uh, she's the person that comes to mind for me. And so we all have those people who have modeled it well for us, right? And we need to think about those. We need to think about the people who are modeling it well, and then we need to figure out how to do what they're doing, right? And who was the ultimate example of all of this? Jesus Christ, right? Um, Let's go back to our seasons of life for just a minute. Um, we all go through seasons of life that are difficult. And I think my, my boys tell me if I told them once in my lifetime, I've told them 5,000 times, um, but comparison is the thief of joy. And that's a Teddy Roosevelt quote. Um, but women, ladies, sister, friends, <laughs> We sometimes do not do a good job of looking at each other and seeing the good in one another. Okay, and we have got to do better in that regard. And we need to learn to be a sacrifice. We need to learn to watch what's happening as we sacrifice young, the young people in the room. And it's what, what a blessing it is to have such a variety of young to old. I think when we're younger... Maybe sometimes it's difficult to see. Maybe we're, we're, it's kind of all about self a little bit. When, and I mean when we're young, young. Uh, it's about our, our own selves and just what we're doing. I think as we get older and we ex begin to experience life, then we understand a little bit more about those sacrifices. Uh, just a personal example is I did not go to school here. I know. It's okay, though. Okay? <laughs> I did not attend school here. but I went to... A major four-year university in the north part of the state in Tallahassee, go Seminoles. <laughs> <laughs> and I went there for four years. I was the third girl out of four children. So I had two older sisters and a younger brother. Um, the sister that's just ahead of me, Julie, was just two years ahead of me. So we actually went to Florida State together. She went in as a junior, and I went in as a freshman. And my daddy was a farmer, and my mama was a school teacher. Okay? And we had everything we needed, but we didn't have a bunch of stuff. Okay? 
But I look back, and I, didn't, I did not recognize this or appreciate it in the moment. But I went to college. My sisters both went to college. We lived off campus, and I never had a student loan in my life. I don't know how my parents did that. I didn't think about it in the moment. I didn't ask questions. But I, as I look back on it, now that I'm a parent of three students in college at the same time, <laughs> man, do I appreciate that. And I can tell you for sure that that had to take sacrifice. Somebody was sacrificing a whole lot of something somewhere. And I'm going to use this example. I didn't know she was going to be here, so this might be when I need the tissues because she's here. But there was a time in uh, Darren and I's life, we had three boys in three and a half years. Okay? Um, we weren't really thinking about that <laughs> at the time. Okay? So <laughs> we got to this point of life, and we had a senior and a sophomore and a freshman in college. We were kind of looked at each other like, what were we thinking? Okay? <laughs> But when, when our boys were little, and I was a stay-at-home mom, and my husband, he sacrificed a lot of time and energy to work, to work hard so that I could stay home with our boys, and that was a sacrifice, right? And money was tight as it is for anybody in that situation, and uh, we really needed a vehicle. We were, we were lacking in that area. And we worshiped with a lady who I'm not going to look at, <laughs> um, who sold us her really, really good van for $5. <laughs> that had to take sacrifice, right? She didn't have to do that. She, she could have had money to herself, but she didn't. She sacrificed that because she saw a need. And that's the type of person that I want to be. And that's the type of the gift that God gives us in the model of what Jesus has done for us. And I think we all understand people in our life who have sacrificed things for us. And so I just wanted to camp out that, on that for just a minute. But I know i got to keep moving. Uh, where am I at on time? Okay, all right. Bonnie's my timekeeper over here. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move kind of quickly through the next part so I can get to some other things. But we need to be holy and acceptable to God. That's where we're at. So uh, with sacrifice, is there always a cost associated with sacrifice? Yes. The question is, are we willing to pay the price? And that's what we need to think about. Scripture goes on to tell us that we need to be holy and acceptable to God. That holy is just set apart. It's sanctified. James 1.27 tells us to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. 2 Corinthians 7.1 says to strive to perfect holiness. This idea of being acceptable or other uh, versions will say well-pleasing. Um, in the Old Testament, there were very specific requirements about what was acceptable. In the New Testament, I think this word acceptable really implies and talks about our relationship with the Lord. Okay? In the Old Testament, in Leviticus, it was talked about that the sacrifices were a pleasing aroma. A sacrifice that is acceptable to God is a sacrifice which God has specified that he wants. And do you know what he wants? All of you. Every bit of you and I, that's what he wants. The next part of it in the New American Standard goes on to say, which is your reasonable service. I'm sorry, New King James says reasonable service. New American Standard says it's our spiritual service of worship. Now, I'm not going to camp out on this worship term too long, but I think sometimes we take this word worship and we put it in a box. And we think, I'm going to worship at 10 a.m. I'm driving to worship. And we get that in our heads. But this is not what worship is. Worship is everything we do every single day. And if that's not daunting, <laughs> I don't know what is. <laughs> okay? But worship is not clocking in and clocking out on Sunday mornings. 
right? Um, it's one of the sermons that I was listening to, you know, he said we have our work life and we have our family life and we have our social life and we have our recreational life and we have our spiritual life. But that's not really what it should look like, right? Because God's not just a piece of the pie. God is the pie. He's the whole thing, right? And so we can't just compartmentalize and put him in as a piece. We represent God everywhere we go. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a quick short story. When, we, when I lived in Chiefland, Florida, we did not have mainstream uh, eating establishments or we were it was small town America still is to most most of the degree but there was a time when I was in high school when little Caesars came to town okay and at that time when little Caesars came to town it was only pizza pizza it was two pizzas it is for you young people it you could not get just one pizza at little Caesars it was pizza pizza okay well, my dad did not know this, and he called to place an order to the new Little Caesars. And when he called, and the, he was trying to explain to them this one pizza that he wanted, the gentleman on the other end wasn't very kind to him. He was rather rude, but he was explaining to him, Sir, you have to get two pizzas. It's pizza pizza. <laughs> and he wasn't very kind. And so, you know what happened there? is my dad hung up the phone, and for the rest of the time that Little Caesars existed in Chiefland, Florida, we did not buy Little Caesars pizza. <laughs> because of that one interaction that he had with a representative of somebody who represented Little Caesars. Okay, now we can put a little bit of that on my dad. He's kind of a rough character sometimes. <laughs> but, that person on the other end wasn't kind. They weren't helpful. They were not representing Little Caesars in a way that made my dad want to give them his business. Okay? And we, in that same way, we represent God every day. And if that doesn't scare us, sister friends, <laughs> right? We've got to wake up and think about the example that we are setting. Okay, um, it goes on to say reasonable. I am going to camp out here for just a minute. Is it reasonable for a person to completely offer all that they have, all that they are, all that they ever will be on the altar to God, fully giving themselves to him? Is that reasonable? People in the world would say, no way. They'd say that's absolutely ridiculous. It's not reasonable. Some people would answer and they would say, yes, it's reasonable, but I'm not enough. Okay? And Jeb and I were having a conversation. And I don't know where my children came from <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> because he, sit and, he sits down with me and he goes, now, Mom, I'm going to explain this to you and... and and I'm going to tell you all this because I, I, it really resonated with me. But I had to get past. My children use big words. <laughs> and he's like, Mom, this is a real dichotomy. <laughs> I looked at him and I was like, okay, we're going to have to back that train up because I'm just a sister friend kind of girl. <laughs> so, so, But this is the way Jeb explained it. And I hope that it resonates with you like it did with me. But these are his words and not mine. He said, Mom, there's a dichotomy of understanding that you are enough, but enough is not enough. And he said, the best that you can give, it's enough to God. But we can't become complacent and think that my best today is just enough. If your best tomorrow can be better than your best today, then that is how we are becoming a living sacrifice. We are striving daily. It's a striving daily of trying to make ourselves acceptable, holy, and pleasing to God. Is it reasonable? 
Yes, absolutely. Because of the mercies that God has shown to us, it is 100% absolutely reasonable to offer everything to God on the altar. Because of his mercies, because of the goodness and the depth of the love that God has shown for us, it is absolutely reasonable. And so how do we do this? You come back tomorrow to find out. <laughs> okay? You come back tomorrow and Thursday. I am going to give you a little bit before we go. Okay? He tells us in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And I'm not going to take the time to read it for the sake of time, but if you go to Romans 12 and you look at verses 9 through 21, maybe I'll just hit a few highlights. My, my family tells me my hobby is talking. So... <laughs> Uh, but if you want to know how you become that living sacrifice and I'm not going to spend a lot of time there because I think some of the other ladies are going to are going to be in these verses but 9 through 21 let love be without hypocrisy abhor what is evil cling to what is good be devoted to one another in brotherly love give preference in to one another in honor and it's going to go on and on but we could, that's enough right there right Right? That's how we do it. That's how we become a living sacrifice every day. And the result is so that we can prove that which is good. And as we come to have a greater appreciation for the will of God, we can finally grasp that everything he asks of us is for our good. There are, two, there are actually three hymns that kept resonating in my mind as I studied this talk. Uh, one of them was take my life and let it be. We're not going to go through the words of that, but if you just think about that for a minute, that's a turning over our lives to him. None of self and all of thee. It's another one that kept popping into my mind. And the last verse of when I survey the wondrous cross, and I won't sing for you because that is not a gift that God gave this sister friend. <laughs> But that final verse says, Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, you can finish it. Demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen. That's right. I follow some positive mental thinking things on social media. Um, and I don't even remember the name of this young man that runs this thing, but all it is is black squares with little white one-line sentences, and they're very powerful in my opinion. I'm going to read one to you real quickly. How am I? I need to be done. Okay. Okay. All right. Give me two minutes, and I'll get you out of here, okay? He says, It is strange to me how often I'm tempted to trust God with my eternity, but not my present. In some ways, it is easy to give God our future because we don't have it. All we really have is the present, and we want to hang on to it real tight. Maybe we see the gospel more like a ticket to a destination somewhere in the future than we see it as a kingdom and a way to walk in the here and now. We have to start by giving every present moment to God over and over and over again. How do we learn how to do anything? How did you learn how to walk and talk? How did you learn how to go to the bathroom? <laughs> all you young mamas out there, don't worry. They're all going to go to the bathroom and walk and talk and read. And when they're 18, they're not going to talk about how old they are when they learn to do it. Okay? <laughs> We learn to do things because we do it over and over and over again. And that is what God is calling us to do, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. In Matthew 16 and verse 24, Jesus said, Take up your cross and follow me. The first followers of Jesus gave up everything to follow him. And guess what, ladies? Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do. When he was in the garden, what did he ask? Let this cup pass from me. He was uncomfortable. 
he was uncomfortable, but he still pressed in. He surrendered and he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. He climbed out of his comfort so that we could be free. And he invites us to do the same every day. Sister friends, I urge you by the mercies of God to present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for the time you have given us today. Lord, please help us to go out into the world every day trying our very best to present ourselves as living sacrifices. Help us remember the remarkable sacrifice that you have made for us. Help us to keep that at the forefront of our minds. Help us to give all glory and honor to you in everything that we do. Be with these ladies. Help everyone to have safe travels throughout this week and as they return to their homes. Forgive us, Lord, when we fall short. Help us to do better. Help us to continuously dedicate ourselves to you in service every day. And most of all, we thank you for that most blessed sacrifice of your son that gives us hope, hope of eternal life in heaven with you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.